Praise the Lord and uh, blessed Easter to each one of you. And uh, for of course, for those out in the area of Canada, it's the next day and it was still here Saturday night. And um, uh, we're glad that uh, we could celebrate uh, Easter established uh, um, the things of God. And um, uh, of course, the, uh, in e Easter is a very big holiday in Australia. Uh, and we always have a four-week weekend from Good Friday all the way to Monday. And uh, when I was first uh, new in Australia, I was quite surprised that what a big holiday it is. And even the malls are closed. And so I remember that when I uh, went to church and then we went to the mall, say, huh? the mall is closed. And the malls never closed in Asia. Uh, and so uh, that was our first impact on the cultural difference. But um, uh, what is Good Friday and what is Easter and in my research on uh, Christ, uh, just of interest to some of you, in my research on Christ and his uh, and his birth and uh, his resurrection, and uh, knowing that our calendar is not exactly correct, uh, that means Christ was not born on like one AD kind of thing. Uh, our calendars are a bit uh, adjusted. And so, in my research, uh, I know there are different theories. Christ was born about fifth uh, BC, and uh, Jewish year or three seven five six. And um, so, he was most likely born around the Passover on five BC, which would have been about twenty first of April, and. Um, if he were born on uh, 4 BC, he would be 11 April, uh, Wednesday. If it were 6 BC, it would have been April the 2nd. But most likely, he was born around uh, 5 BC on Passover. And the 21st of April, uh, Passover would have been on a Friday. That would be interesting. So, uh, so uh, celebration of Good Friday that is there. And um, <clears throat> Christ would have passed, if he were born on 5 BC, uh, then when he was uh, 33 years old uh, and he died for us on the atonement, that would have been roughly about um, uh, 20, around probably about 27 AD. Even though the Passover 26 AD would have been Tuesday, 19 April, but the Passover on 27 AD uh, would have been um, roughly about 9th of April. And so, most likely, uh, Christ would have passed or died on the, he died, we know, on the Passover. He was a Lamb of God. So on the 28th AD, Passover was around the 26th of April. And it was on a Friday. And since it's on a Friday, it means that the uh, communion that Jesus celebrated with them would have been on the evening on the, on the Thursday. And uh, after 6 p.m., they have the uh, Passover lamb, which takes until the next day, Friday, 6 p.m. So it would have been, Jesus would have died on a Friday and, uh, and on the Thursday before that was the Passover celebration. So... To a certain extent, that would have been roughly the dates. And I have been researching quite long to find, you know, roughly what year in our calendar 
uh, try to have done all these things. So that is of interest to those of you who are interested in uh, in these things. And I did research uh, what day the Jewish celebration was on different years. Um, and it would have been on a Thursday, 25th of April, 28 AD, and it would have been, uh, um, uh, or Passover would have on a 28, most likely it's a 28 uh, AD, that the Passover occurred on a Friday, and that would have been the day that Jesus would have died. That, brings you to about exactly three days uh, before Sunday that Jesus rose from the dead on Easter Sunday. Uh, and, and, and that's what we are celebra celebrating. And uh, so those of you who are, who are historical fans uh, would like to research in the history, uh, that is my research that I've done. Uh, on the exact dates of the Passover and when Christ Jesus died for us on the cross. And that would have been, um, 20, uh, it, it would have been Friday 26th uh, of April uh, that Christ was crucified. And the Passover when he made covenant with us would have been on a Thursday the night before. So Jesus uh, already took upon himself the cup of sin and salvation. So Jesus could see on a Friday, we have Friday and then we Saturday and then and then Sunday he rose again. But more or less it's counted from the Thursday when he took the cup and became the Lamb of God for us. Praise the Lord. And uh, so as we look at uh, the resurrection of Christ they celebrated on Easter, um, I'd like to continue this theme that we speak about on uh, restoration, refreshing and restoration. And today, I want to especially talk about the restoration of the power of God upon His church. Um, the church of Jesus Christ uh, was supposed to function in power. Paul says that his preaching is not just in words, but in demonstration of the power power of God. In Acts chapter 1, uh, the disciples were told in Luke 24, verse 49, not to leave Jerusalem. And it was repeated again in Acts 1, that they shall receive power so that they can be witnesses. Do you know that we were never supposed to be powerless? We were born, the church was born to be Power. But unfortunately, like the Israelites when they land, went into the land of Canaan, <clears throat> they did not fully conquer the land. In the same way, even though the early church in Jerusalem, after the pouring, outpouring the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, the church excelled for a time and reach its fullness around Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5. And then the church started declining because the church compromised. They could not understand that they were a new faith, a new religion. It took uh, many more years before the church separated from Judaism and become a faith and religion of its own. And that was only when the Gentiles started being converted. And uh, by Acts 13, the church had, uh, had a group that were non-Jews and they started calling themselves by the name Christians. So the church did went through a sort of metamorphosis to slowly grow, and today Christianity is recognized as a separate faith and religion from Judaism. But in the early days, it was not easy. And in the same way, we have a typology in how the Israelites were supposed to go in the land of Canaan, conquer the land of Canaan, and dwell, and become, quote-unquote, the established kingdom of God in the land of Canaan. But because of the failure of the Israelites, 
they continue to have different problems even like while in the land of Canaan. And they did not reach their fullness. Uh, their fullness was only reached until the days of David, uh, followed by Solomon. And after that began the decline. The story of the church was that it was actually born in power and in the Acts 1 was it did take place. And then after that, it began to decline. You can see the decline started when they compromised with Judaism and they could not separate themselves from uh, Judaism. Even the Paul was sent forth. Paul was called to be a, an apostle of the Gentiles to establish this new faith, this new faith in Christ, completely separated from Judaism. Christ was the Messiah to the Jews who rejected him and he became the saviour to all Gentiles and to the Jews who believe as a separate faith. The church was supposed to exercise authority and power over all sickness and disease. And even in James, it talked about how if anyone is sick, let them call the elders and be anointed and be healed. But Generally, today, if someone is sick, even a Christian, they behave exactly the same way as a, uh, uh, a heathen. The first thing they reach to would be to their medicine and to the uh, general uh, doctors. And uh, sometimes the last thing they do is to pray and ask God to heal them. Many Christians today don't even believe in the gifts of healing and in the working of miracles, and in the power of prayer over sickness, disease, infirmities, or any type of problems that they were having. The faith is very weak in general Christianity. So like the Israelites, we have not been possessing the land. We have not been exercising our authority that God has given to us. How many Christians, when they have uh, an ailment, a sickness, straight away go to God and anoint me all and say, Thank you, Lord, for healing me. And most of them are not reaching out to God, nor is the establishment of the authority and power of the church over sickness and diseases fully established. And so as we look at refreshing, re refreshing and restoration, we ask ourselves the question, when will the church rise in its fullness, in power, that was originally given to us in the first place? And when we look at uh, the book of Genesis, you see in Genesis chapter 15, when God first made a covenant with Abraham, uh, he speaks about several things. Among the things that God mentioned is that in verse 16, of Genesis 15. In the fourth generation, they shall return here. There is a land of Canaan that Abraham actually was standing upon. Uh, he has been told to go and build altars around the whole land of Canaan because land belonged to him, given to him. But the Lord says, the sin of the Amorites, and even though there were many Canaanites, uh, Jebusites and everything else, and Hittites and Perizzites, Gugasites. God especially mentioned the Amorites because they were the dominant uh, Canaanites in that land. And God says, the sin is not at the level where I will wipe them out and kill them. <laughs> God is merciful and He gives them time perhaps to change their ways and all that. And in the end, when 400 years had passed and the Israelites went into the land of Canaan, <clears throat> it was ready to uh, fulfill Abraham's covenant and complete the conquest of the Amorites. Uh, notice that uh, in the time of uh, uh, Moses, it was very clear when they came from Egypt, 
what they were supposed to do. And we read from um, the book of Exodus when God uh, spoke to them. Mm -hmm. uh, here in uh, Exodus, uh, let's see. Yes, in chapter 13, verse 5. Uh, on this day, Exodus 13, verse 4 onwards, On this day you are going out in a month of Abib. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites, the Hevites and the Jebusites, uh, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. Now, why were the Amorites specifically mentioned? Mainly because the Amorites still have the genetic of the fallen angels and the giants. And God wiped them out once in the flood, but uh, some of them got through. After the flood, they were still around. So the Bible says here, uh, God would not sort of cause genocide on the human race. But what happens was this was not the human race. This was an infiltration of the giants crossed through the flood in some way. And uh, some of them were giants. In fact, the Amorites held genetics of the giants still in them. And in... Uh, Exodus chapter 32, uh, verse 2, it says, And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hevite and the Jebusite. So God did uh, speak about uh, uh, removing all these people uh, to completely drive them out. Uh, repeated again in Exodus 34. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Heva, and the Jebusite. And uh, it says, Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest, lest there be a snare in your midst. You shall destroy their altars break their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> they were uh, totally to annihilate this, especially this group of people. And it was God's special commandment to them that they were to obey this. And uh, <clears throat> in the end, when the Israelites uh, went into the went into the land of Canaan. Now, part of the Amor uh, Amorites were in the eastern side of the border. And two of them, uh, King Sihon and King Ok of Bashan, were among the so-called Amorites. And they were conquered under Moses. Of course, Joshua was used by God. And then there were the others on the west side of the Jordan, you know, which they conquered. And remember, the, when, they, when they were advancing into that, uh, among the people who rose against them were the five kings. They were later trapped in the cave. All the five kings were Amorites. And they were especially mentioned because they were the people to be slaughtered and to be removed. God wants to remove the genetics of the Amorites from the human race. <laughs> so, um, here is um uh here is the uh the thing that God continues to do and in the book of Judges <clears throat> it tells us here um that they were unsuccessful in removing all the Canaanites and the incom uncompleted land of conquest. And these are the reasons given in the book of Joshua chapter 1, uh, in the book of Judges chapter 1. Um, and it says here, <clears throat> of each tribe and all that they face. In fact, 
the tribe of Judah under Caleb uh, took the most difficult conquest, which was uh, the Anakim. And it says here um, that Caleb asked for the land of the Anakims. And he conquered that. So it says here, um, let's read here from chapter 1 uh, of the book of Judges. And uh, verse 3. Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me to my allotted territory that we may fight against the Canaanites. I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. Simeon went, and the whole tribe of Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the parasites into their hand. He killed 10,000 men at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek in Bezek and <clears throat> fought against him. They defeated the Canaanites, the parasites, and uh, then uh, in verse 8, the children of Judah fought against Jerusalem, took it, they struck it with the edge of the sword, set the city in fire. After the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites to dwell in the mountains and in the south and the lowland. And Judah went against the Canaanites who dwell in Hebron. Now, Hebron later became the center of David's uh, first uh, kingship. And now the name of Hebron was formerly Kajah Abba. And later you read that the reason it's called Kajah Abba because Abba was the, like the, the greatest champion of the Anakim. And he ruled there. And <clears throat> they were, in the end, uh, defeated. <clears throat> and Caleb was the one who says uh, that uh, he wants to take over the area. And uh, then we continue. Let's read uh, this area in verse 18. Judah took Gaza with the territory, Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. So the Lord was with Judah, and they drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron. So there was a technology issue. And uh, so they would need the wisdom of God how to conquer these people who have chariots of iron, uh, which they did not have. And they give Hebron to Caleb, as Moses has said. Then he expelled from there the three sons of Anak. And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day, the day of the writing of uh, the Judges. <clears throat> but it's interesting that uh, Judah could not defeat the, uh, all of them because of technology issue. Uh, if they ask God, I'm sure God will have uh, teach them how to defeat these people with chariots of iron. But there are different reasons given and uh, most of them in the end did not complete the destruction or remove all the people from the land. <clears throat> But you see in places like Judges chapter 1, verse 34, <clears throat> and the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley. And the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Harris, in Ajilon, and in Sha'abim. Uh, yet when the strength of the house of Joseph became greater, they were put under tribute instead of destroying them. So these are the stories that were there. And the angel, of course, in chapter 2, came and rebuked them and says to them that, uh, that they have not, they have not uh, removed all these uh, inhabitants. And uh, in verse, chapter 2, was uh, looking at uh, verse 2, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I, I said, I will not drive them out before you. Because you didn't do it, so I, I won't let you, 
uh, be with you to help you again. And they all got rebuilt by the angel of God. Now, some things about uh, the Amorites that we need to know that uh, the Amorites were actually uh, giants and a lot of them have the DNA of the giants. And um, uh, not only just false gods, they were actually uh, genetically uh, supposed to be destroyed from the human race. In the end, tiny bit of them still exist in Gaza among the Philistines. But let's look and see some of the things um, uh, in uh, the Amorites. And why were they specially mentioned And uh, in the story of uh, the Canaanites to be destroyed? <clears throat> you see, even in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, then the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath. And Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. Also, there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. You notice that the Philistines were like a subset among the Amorites. Uh, they had to be destroyed. And we continue reading. The Amorites continue to exist. Now, uh, here is like a little summary in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 18. And Giba, the son of Uri, the land of Gilead, in the country of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and of Ok, king of Bashan. And you know, Ok, king of Bashan, was classified among the Amorites, but he was a giant. Oh, yeah, the DNA of the giants. And so they sort of summarize all that they conquered on the on the east side of Jordan. And um, then uh, it says in 1 Kings 9.20, and uh, it says, All the people who were left of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, who were not of Israel, that is, their descendants were left in the land after them, whom the children of Israel had not been able to destroy completely. From these, Solomon raised forced labor. So again, they were put as slaves, but they were not destroyed completely. What happens when you don't destroy them? They will continue to be a hindrance to the people of God. And even in the time of the kings, after David, after Solomon, it says something about Ahab. You know, Ahab was among the worst king in the northern kingdom. It says in 1 Kings 21, verse 25, there was no other like Ahab. And of course, Jezebel was with her. It was like a a couple of evil, who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols, according to all that the Amorites had done, whom God had cast out before the children of Israel. I mean, isn't it a terrible thing? You conquer the land and many generations later, the king of the land behaved like the Amorites. You think how much God was displeased. I sent you in to conquer them, you got conquered by them. And he became like them. And so, he said of all these people, and you see that even in the time of Ezra, after the whole kingdom was demolished and sold to slavery under the Babylonian Empire, and then they returned, even in the return after 70 years, the Amorites were still there. It says in the time of Ezra, verse 9, that the people who came back from the into the promised land are... Uh, 
we respect in verse 1, Ezra chapter 9, verse 1, we respect to the abominations, the Canaanites, Hezites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of this land. And Ezra tore his clothes and told the people this should not happen, and he went into fasting. Look at these people, the Amorites, from the time of Abraham all the way to the time of Solomon was still there. All the way to the Ezra, when they came back to rebuild, was still there. So in a way, they could not reach their fullness. In fact, the Israelite kingdom in the land of Canaan reached its fullness only under King David. And under King David, uh, he himself, by God's predestination, slay Goliath, who is a seed of the giants. And his brother, Jonathan, in the end also slaughtered and killed uh, the other giant. And only under King David did they rise to their fullness. So from the time of Joshua to the time of David was a long time for them to reach their fullness. And from the time of the beginning of the church in Acts 2 until 2,000 years later, here we are. The church might have expanded, but there's a lot of pollution and worldliness in the church. But the church has not reached its full power yet. That's why there's an end time move to bring the church to the stature of the fullness of Christ. The restoration of the church. Now, what would be the things that need to be done to bring the church to its fullness? Of course, the first is to separate from the Canaanites. The Canaanites are now represented by the worldliness of this planet Earth and the world and all its false idolatry and religions. For us, the land of Canaan is the planet and the church are the chosen people of God. <clears throat> you can never reach your fullness as long as the Canaanites live peaceably among you. The world is our enemy. The devil is our enemy. They can never be our ally. They can never be our friend. He who is a friend to the world is an enemy of God. In order for the Israelites to reach their fullness, they must get rid of the Canaanites, the Amorites, Jebusites. And one of the first things that David did when he became king over Israel was to conquer the Jebusites and take over Jerusalem. So there is a pattern to it. <laughs> How David, in the end, brought all that they were supposed to do, not done throughout all the time of the judges, throughout all the time of the descendants of second generation that went in, they never fully obeyed God. So when we look at why the church has not reached its full power, number one, there was no separation from the Canaanites, Jebusites, Amorites, Hevites, and all those people in the land of Canaan. Why hasn't the church reached its full power? We have not separated fully from the world. In fact, the church, even under its most powerful expansion of Christianity, outwardly, not inwardly, in the time of Constantine, and you thought, wow, it's good. The emperor has become a Christian. The Roman em Empire has become the Holy Roman em Empire. 
instead of it being fully good, it was a compromise. There were a lot of people who accepted Christianity not because they were converted, but because it was the most popular thing to do. After all, the emperor himself had become a Christian, so Christianity had become popular. And if you read what happened during those days, there were whole groups of people who were not born again and they just thought of spray or pour water on them as a good as they Okay, now you're all Christian. No one was born again. Christianity had become worldly. It has become the world, synonymous with the world. And by the time, the during the time of Constantine, the Pope was slowly rising in power. In fact, there were... a a vying of power among the popes and uh, the Roman Pope against the Antioch Pope and uh, different popes. And they wonder which one of them should be the main uh, speaker for Christianity. And over the years, slowly, 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 the Roman Pope became the most powerful and then he became the papacy. And in the time of the Roman papacy, you can read about it in the two Babylons. All sorts of evil happened in, in, in Rome, in the Vatican. And at one time, you know, uh, and the popes have uh, secret uh, mistresses. At one time, there was even a feminine pope. And the position of being a pope was even bought and sold. And it be, it's literally just a an uh, institution of worldly power in the guise and name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, the church was polluted and by the time Martin Luther exists in the 17th century, they even lost the meaning of salvation. <clears throat> so, a revival has to take place. And since the Reformation up to today, you know what the Lord has been trying to bring? He, has, he wanted to bring back the power, the authority that He has given to the church. But for it to happen, number one, there has to be a separation between the canonized Jebusites and the Israelites. For the church, there has to be a separation between church and in the world. We do live in the world, but Jesus in John 17 says we are not of the world, not of the nature of the world. So for restoration to take place, there has to be a separation. Number two, there will be an increase in the activity of angels. Each time you see uh, signs, wonders and miracles, there is always the appearance of angels. And one of the momentous times when God do a lot of signs and wonders was in the time of the Exodus. And you see that Moses himself had the appearance of angels in the burning bush. And then Joshua had the appearance of the angel as the captain of the Lord of hosts. And uh, <clears throat> in, in everywhere where they was the period of signs and wonders, even in the time of Elijah, who is the prophet famous for signs and wonders, Elijah worked with angels. And this is because of this dispensation of God. And the history and the story of angels and mankind is interesting. Somewhere after the flood, uh, humans began to lose their uh, visions. And uh, so they cannot see angels anymore and relate to them. And, and uh, angels and humans who were like partners together in this uh, dispensation of the planet Earth uh, slowly became separated. So suddenly angels were invisible to humans and, and humans functioned without their angelic guides. But from time to time, angels uh, with the energy and uh, given to them and with the uh, permission given to them were allowed to manifest to humans. 
And when they manifest and work together, like Moses working together with you know, the angel that uh, spoke to him, and Joshua working together with the captain of Lord of Hosts, they began to do mighty things again. And <clears throat> from that time until our time today, where angels are more or less like invisible to most people, and those who can see them through the gift of discerning of spirits uh, are few, there will be again the dispensation of God when God allow the manifestations of angels to increase so that we can work with them. Why work with them? See, God is a God of order. In the book of Psalms 103, it is especially mentioned about how angels were are those whom God has given power. And when God has distributed certain things, He 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 makes use of them. One of the interesting things I see in about Revelation is that when a person becomes an embodiment of uh, Revelation, God will use them. Of course, Jesus and God and Holy Spirit can directly give that revelation. But when you want some revelation, let's say of Israel, God might. You know, bring forth and send Daniel to, to talk to you. Or when you want to know about, um, let's say, about uh, revelation of love, suddenly you might have an encounter with the Apostle John. And so uh, it seems that those who have become in their lifetime the embodiment of revelation, God continue to send, uh, send them and use them even from the spiritual world to teach those who are alive today about those revelations. And that continues to be so, which is interesting to me in the spiritual world. So God has already codified that the angels represent his military force. And when God wants to advance his army on the earth and defeat all of the fallen angels and all their works and destroy them, he will use his angels. And so the encounter that we will have, number two, uh, to bring forth restor restoration is uh, to encounter the visibility and the uh, uh, multiplication of angelic encounters so that God could do mighty signs and wonders. And you notice, even Philip the evangelist in the book of Acts, seems to work with angels and sent by angels, led by angels. And angels have always been like the military force of God's kingdom and they will continue to manifest even more in the last days as God wants to do signs and wonders. And it was an angel that, that led them, angel that went before them, angel who appeared to them through all the time of the Exodus and the time of the Judges that God says, you're supposed to destroy all these people. And uh, sadly, they did not. But yet, the principle of God continues to be there. As it was in the times of the Old Testament, so it will be in the times of the New Testament that when God wants to do a greater signs and wonders and the works of Jesus, which we are supposed to do, there will be number two, an increase in the manifestation of angels to us. And we need to welcome that and not be afraid of that. And angels actually do a lot of testing in individuals to see our response before they can appear in their fullness. And during the 1950s revival, the greatest of the restoration or healing was under the ministry of William Branham, who an angel appeared and went with him in all his meetings. And because of him, people like T.L. Osborne saw that thing and he said, yes, we can do this. And many evangelists with signs and wonders started uh, being uh, sent forth uh, unfortunately, uh, William Abraham went off track in uh, wrong teaching and uh, then he died in an accident. Uh, he's still safe, but 
uh, if God didn't stop him, uh, more false doctrines would have been multiplied. Today, there's an extreme group who sort of think that he is the he's the Elijah to come and 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 he and he is to bring forth the thing, uh, but he is not. He's already died and gone. And so a lot of false doctrines uh, arise around them. One is the serpent seed. Two is that he is the Elijah to come. And many other false doctrines that were spread. Today, we need a fresh new generation who are open to visions, open to revelations, open to the demonstration of God's power to bring forth the fullness of God upon the earth. So number one is separation, which the Israelites did not do. Number two is encounter with angels that whenever they come for, even some of the judges encounter angels and Gideon himself. And, uh, and it was through the encounter angels that they demonstrate power and deliverance to the people of God. So today, open yourself to the fact that it is the permission of God and it is what God allows for us to encounter visions and demonstrations of angelic visitation to bring us to the fullness of God. So we started as a mankind before the fall, very close, hand in hand with angels, and slowly differentiated until our angels became invisible to God. But throughout the Old Testament, from time to time, they manifest and work together. It was powerful. And then we are back to our modern age where you know, some believe in angels, some do not. And uh, then towards the end time, again, the two go hand in hand to bring forth the will of God on the planet Earth and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was on Earth, he worked with uh, all the four angels, including uh, spirit beings, and that was uh, what brought forth a lot of the signs and wonders that Jesus did. And so let's continue to open ourselves to encounter the angels, visitations, visions and revelations that are part of God's plan to bring forth the fullness of the church. The third thing that brought forth the Israelites to their fullness was to establish, uh, to establish the flow of authority. And in the time of the Israelites, from the time of the judges, where from time to time there was one here, one there, one here, one there, until Samuel, who was one of the last and final judges, to the time of David, the Israelites were divided. I mean, they were each a state on their own. And they tried to come together a book of Judges at the ending, but not fully success, not fully successful. It was only when they were under King David that all of them united. But it took several steps. First, David was anointed to be a king. And then he slowly rise in his ability and power. It was after he was anointed to be king that uh, the encounter with the lions and the bears took place. And later, the encounter with Goliath, whom he slayed. And then the people still did not accept him as a king. Uh, he was just a soldier. And even King, uh, king Saul tried to get, kill him, chase him out. Uh, he was a fugitive under the tribe of Judah, anointed him as king after Saul died. And David put his headquarters in Hebron. And interestingly, Hebron, uh, which was or originally Kajah Abba, the city of the giants, and uh, uh, that Caleb uh, established as uh, his land. And at Hebron, David became king. Very symbolic. Hebron was the place of the destruction under, under judges under the time of Joshua, the destruction of the Anakim. The very people that caused them so much fear that they were delayed for 40 years. In the end, the story behind it is you must face 
your enemy in the eye. The enemy that you must defeat even 40 years later, you still must defeat them. The enemy that had held authority over all the land of Canaan, you must defeat. Delay doesn't defeat them. You still must defeat them. And that is why it's given unto the church to restrain, together with the Holy Spirit, the Antichrist. The symbol of the rebellion of the fallen angels. You must not be afraid of Satan and his fallen angels. The enemy that Jesus defeated has a reason again and try to usurp the authority that Jesus has given to the church. He usurped the authority of Adam and today he usurped the authority given to the body of Christ. The enemy still must be defeated in our generation and time. We must stand and crush Satan under our feet. Stand and crush the fallen angels under our feet. This enemy still must be defeated. Cannot escape the calling of God. And the anointing to be a king was given to David. The anointing to be a king is given to each one of you. All of us are kings and priests in Jesus. And on this Easter day, may I remind you that you're a king and priest anointed by God with authority to function in your community, in your nation as a king. Exercise the authority in God's perfect will. Take control of the principalities and the powers and the fallen angels that are in your community and in your nation. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, crush Satan under your feet. And as Jesus confronted Jesus, uh, confronted Satan in his first encounter after his anointing, so must we. The enemy must be defeated. Sin must be defeated. Fallen angels must be defeated. They were already defeated under Christ. And you remember what Joshua did when he took the five kings out of the cave of the Amorites? Uh, the Amorites? He forced them to go down and then he commanded the leaders of his army to take their feet and put it under, put it on the neck of all the Amorite kings. Altogether, they defeated 31 kings. You are kings and priests of God with the power and ability to defeat kings on the earth. And they must not be frightened. The reason Joshua asked them to put their feet on the neck of these Amorite kings is so that they were personally experienced putting the enemy under their feet. Yes, Jesus has put Satan and fallen angels under his feet. But each one of us as a leader in the body of Christ for the restoration to take place must believe in the anointing authority God has given to us and crush the enemy under our feet. The anointing to be king that was given to David has been given in Christ, the seed of Judah, has been given to us, his disciples. We must make use of the authority. Every time you encounter any situation, any sickness, any difficulty, the first thing to do is use the authority first. Anoint we all. 
Use the power of Jesus' name and receive your healing. Receive the anointing of God. Defeat sickness. Defeat diseases. Defeat Satan. Put them all under your feet. And then you will know that in this life, you shall live under the power of the name of Jesus. That's what the Bible sings about. The name of the Lord is a high power. And we live in the authority and power of the name of Jesus. Call upon the name of Jesus. Live under the power, authority, and name of Jesus. And you shall crush Satan and demons under your feet. Do not be afraid of sickness, diseases, demons, even Satan himself. He shall resist the enemy and he shall flee from you. The Lord has been waiting for his church to take that anointing as a priest and king to rise. You see, David did not become a king automatically. He had some followers in the Adulam K, 400, later expanded to 600. But he has to take his sword and go forth and fight. The same with us. Your sword is the word of God. And you will go forth and fight. And use the authority of the sword of Jesus' power's name. And everything is a challenge. Every sickness that tries to come upon you is a challenge. Every demonic oppression, suppression is a challenge. Every potential defeat that you temporarily suffer is a challenge. But we shall rise as kings and priests. Command in the name of Jesus. Hold fast. How long should you hold fast? Until the enemy yields. There's no timing that is given. You shall hold fast to the name of Jesus. You shall rise in the name of Jesus. Because you'll be anointed king like David. And when the tribe of Judah, which represents praise and worship, when praise and worship is increased, the whole tribe of praise and worship surrounds you. <clears throat> Surround yourself with praise and worship. Increase in praise and worship. Let the tribe of Judah, the tribe of praise and worship, increase among us. For the tribe of Judah <clears throat> was the secret power of David. If the tribe of Judah didn't support him, the other ten tribes were not. So, surround yourself with the tribe of Judah. People who are into praise and worship. People who love praise and worship. Increase your fellowship with those who are in praise and worship. Enter into the sanctuary of those who understood praise and worship. And we will increase praise and worship we will, by the power of God, establish 24-hour praise and worship throughout all the whole planet Earth. And as we establish them, be part of it, enter into praise and worship. Today, we do have people taking slots in praise and worship. Continue strong in that. And whenever we pray on a Friday, 24-hour, uh, in our five-hour prayer and in the five-hour worship, Join in. Be part of that. The more of us who praise and worship, even five hours and even taking slots in a 24-hour time, the more the tribe of Judah increases and it will establish the authority of David in Hebron as it were with us. And Hebron represents the city of the enemy that we take and make it the HQ. And is a place of the defeat of the Anakim. So the third thing must take place is the people of God must rediscover the authority of kingship and priesthood. And together we praise and worship, increasing praise and worship, we will build our Hebron. We will build a place of the defeat of the enemy and that's when David became a mighty king. There was a battle between King David in Hebron and the ten tribes in Samaria. And the Bible says that uh, the house of Saul became weaker and weaker 
and the house of David became mightier and mightier. And so Hebron must take place. The praise and worship that God has given to us must take place. The defeat of the enemy in our personal lives, then in your environment, and then in the life of your city and your community must take place. And as we rise in the anointing that God has given to us, signs and wonders will come forth. Boldly go forth. Command in the name of Jesus. And it will surprise you how powerful the name of Jesus is. As you begin to see sickness and disease heal, demons cast out. And the authority of the kingship of Jesus is re-established into the church. So that was the first thing that took place. The rise of King David. And under King David, finally, finally, the whole land of Canaan was subdued. It took them a long, long time. The same as it's taken us a long, long time, nearly 2,000 years. First, we had to discover the doctrine, who we are, what we have. And through all these years, especially in end time move, we have understood our calling. We have understood who we are. So call upon the name of Jesus. Shout the name of Jesus from the mountain tops. In the name of Jesus, take authority. Take authority. Take authority. Proclaim the name of Jesus. And we rise into the fullness of the power of God. On the 24th of March, 2024, we have anointed each one of you to be a king. Take control of Hebron. Rise in the name of Jesus. Rise in praise and worship. And the authority of the kingdom of God shall be displayed. In the end, David established the kingdom of God in the land of Canaan. He lived for 70 years and passed it on to Solomon. So all in, David was king for 40 years. 33 years in Jerusalem. 7 years in Hebron. The restoration has begun. You have been anointed as king on the 24th of March, 2024. Take authority. Enter into as much praise and worship as possible. And we will see the rule and reign of our Lord Jesus once again. Amen. The fourth thing that took place and was to establish a covenant. A covenant with the Lord. And uh, David did it. And it's called uh, the Davidic covenant that God made with him. And after Solomon died, the kingdom became shaken. Once in a while, you have a good king. And each new king did something. They renew the covenant with God. Then God blessed the king as much as he can. And again, they got back some authority. Again, they get back some power until another evil king come and destroy everything. And in the end, the covenant of David was fulfilled in Christ. The king of kings who cannot be defeated who died and rose again, where death itself is defeated. Remember, the last enemy that the church will destroy is death. So know our calling and know all that God has commanded us to 
express. In the end, we have authority over death. Now, death is behind all sickness and disease. Death, death came in the time of Adam. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I read to you this. How much of the restoration will we experience in this end time move? Bible tells us here in chapter 15, verse 20. Now, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man, that is Jesus, also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in, its, in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all his enemies under his feet. And there are many enemies. But the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. And when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who puts all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So those of you who believe in the resurrection, you must be like uh, Martha who says, Yes, Lord, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. But Christ says, I am the resurrection. Not in the future, but now. Do you know what born again is? In the book of James 2, it says that faith without works is dead. The, the body without the spirit is dead. But the spirit that is inside you is not an ordinary spirit. It's the new spirit born of the resurrection power of Jesus. In analogy, if the spirit inside us gives life to the body, how much greater is the life that we have if the spirit in us is a new spirit born of the resurrection power of Jesus? So our body is not sustained by the old spirit that we receive when we were first born onto the earth. Our body right now is sustained by the resurrection power of Jesus inherent in our newborn spirit. It must be different. A lot of Christians say, I don't feel any different to born again. Oh yes, something inside your spirit, in your heart says you have peace with God. But we need to know what we have. What we have is a new spirit born of the resurrection power of Jesus. Why do you think Paul in Philippians chapter 2 and then also in chapter 3 speak about that he wants to know the power of his resurrection. And he's not talking about just spiritual resurrection. It's talking about resurrection of the physical body. You look at what Paul says. Look at him in Philippians. Let's look at Philippians for a moment. And in Philippians chapter 3, he says, he wants to know these things. And he wants to attain in chapter 
uh, three virtual. Not that I already attained or already perfected, he said. But I press on that I may lay hold of, that I may receive, lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. I do not count myself to have apprehended. That means he didn't count himself as already got everything. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he's aiming for that, a very high aim. And what is his aim later? He speaks about it in verse 2021. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Hallelujah. And remember, he did say this in uh, verse uh, 9, uh, that he says uh, he wants to be found not in his own righteousness but in God. In verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain. Now, the word attain is slightly more powerful than obtain. The word attain means to arrive at, because it's a gift of God, that I may arrive at the resurrection from the dead. He didn't take it as an automatic thing. It's something to be desired, something to be uh, pressed forward into. He wants to know the power of his resurrection. Death has to be conquered. It must first be conquered in the bodies of the saints of God. And then it will be conquered in all of nature. Do you know that even nature around us is waiting for the resurrection power? It groans to see the resurrection of power upon it. So nature actually is wanting to welcome the resurrection power of Jesus in his environment. I believe in the future when we plant in cities of refuge, uh, places of refuge, agriculture, when we pray the resurrection power of Jesus will come upon our lands and our trees and our fruit and they shall fruitful, powerfully, like in the time of Obed-Edom, when the ark was with him, like the rod of, of Aaron in the midst of the presence of God. Nature is crying and groaning for resurrection power. But it has to come forth through the body of Christ. So know that number four, the resurrection of power of Christ will be in our spirit, it will be in our soul, and it will be in our bodies. Don't just keep the resurrection of power in your spirit. Let it flow upon your soul, renew your mind, bring your mind to the highest level. Bring your thinking, bring your thoughts, bring your affection, your splatna. And your news, your uh, dianoia, your dialogismos, up into the fullest dimension. Bring your emotions, bring your will, bring your mind into the resurrection power of Jesus. And then let it flow in fullness into the physical body and physical realm. That is number four, what God is waiting for. The same resurrection power that was in Christ Jesus is 
waiting to flow forth into our souls and into our physical bodies. And it's a promise of God and it's what God wants to see. So we go back again to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But the enemy called death that will be destroyed that will be destroyed. It tells us in uh, verse um, 13, we shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed. And the word change is lasso. That means a transformation that is of a different type. Change, transform. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Resurrection power is greater than death. And Death itself has been defeated by Jesus. And the defeat of death has not been fully imputed or received by the body of Christ. But that's what God is going to do. He will bring the resurrection body power into our spirit, soul and body. It's part of our privilege. Because the rapture is a demonstration of that. And those who are alive will see in the twinkling of an eye the resurrection body of Jesus function. It doesn't even need a long time. It's instantaneous in a nanosecond. It's powerful. It's something like uh, what we experience in transportation. And I remember when I was transported uh, in between two thoughts. And I was thinking about different things of God at that time. And in between one thought to another thought, I was transported into a different uh, place. It's amazing how God works there. But it is powerful. Now, one of the things that God is going to demonstrate in his end time is transportation. Do you know that transportation completely uh, ceased after Adam uh, received death when he sinned? Because the body becomes heavier and, and he used to be able to see something and transport. But it failed. And now we have to use all kinds of human technology and things to transport us. But once upon a time, we could think of a place and physically transport. That stopped after Adam fell to sin. But those who walk with God in the Spirit experience that. Such as Elijah. And as you become filled and full of the Spirit, your body takes a different, um, I call it uh, a different arrangement, such that Elijah was famous for being able to transport himself. And some are saying, look, he, you know, how to find him? He can transport himself. And the only other person that I know did that is Jesus. And behind 
all his appearance to his disciples, Jesus transported himself. Uh, he, he could just move from one place to another. And the one time when he was doing a slow motion was when he was walking on the water, going to, you know, to another place. And the disciples were very frightened. The spirit within us has power over our bodies. The book of Romans 8 tells us that the resurrection power of Jesus is already working on our mortal bodies because it's preparing our mortal bodies to instantly be transported, be instantly transformed. And it doesn't wait until that time. Romans 8 says, Now, the resurrection power of Jesus is on every cell and molecule of our physical body. And in the end times, I know one of the things that will take place is transportation. And then there will come a time when the physical body itself is changed into a resurrected body. Death is finally defeated. And in these days of the kingdom of God being established in the days of the Ten Toes, we are privileged to receive things like that. So we will see, number four, the resurrection power of Jesus transforming our souls and our physical bodies. That will take place. But first, we must believe doctrine. We must believe the word of God. And it will set us on the path to the fullness of the resurrection body, Christ. Paul himself speaks of that. Remember, he says he wants to attain. He wants to reach the Resurrection power from the dead. He wants to attain to the resurrection from the dead. I mean, Paul really believed God's word. And he says he hasn't been perfected yet, but he pressed forward to attain, to receive that which he know belongs to him. And he knows in verse 21 of Philippians 3 that God will transform our lowly body to conform to His glorious body. Look at verse 21 of Philippians 3. Today is the, it's good to flow in the resurrection power of that. Do you know that Paul really, really believed that he could attain to the fact that change his lowly body into the glorious body of Jesus. And according to the energizing and working in which Jesus is able, able to subdue all things to himself. Paul really believed the resurrection power of Jesus could transform his physical body. It's powerful. I believe the same thing as Paul. I believe that in this lifetime, we don't have to be sick and die. We don't have to die. But those of us who believe can be transformed by the resurrection power of Jesus. Because our hands are His hands. We are the flesh of His flesh, bone of His bone. And the same resurrected body of Jesus can be imparted into us. Because... Jesus is a vine, we are his branches. We are the same DNA. Because the spirit of resurrection is already in our spirits. And the spirit of resurrection in Romans 8 is already working on our physical body. Giving Zoe life into our physical body. Our physical body is every day receiving the spiritual life of the resurrection power of Jesus. And God is waiting for us to open our faith, to open our belief, to open our hearts and our minds. 
to the reality that we can receive the fullness of his resurrection power in our physical bodies. Amen. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. That even as the land of Canaan was given to Israel, but it took them so long to fulfill it. Under the time of David and Solomon. We thank you that you've given us the promises of God from the day that the church was born. It was born in power and it will return to God in power. We will not be a weak, sick, disabled church. We will be the glorious body of Jesus Christ. We who are in this generation do believe. There are probably a lot in the body of Christ who don't even believe. They've been taught to accept the fact that they will grow sick, old and die. That is not what we see in your word. We, will, we believe in the resurrection power of Jesus on our physical body. So our bodies will be renewed and become the glorious body of Jesus by which you have the power to subdue all things, to defeat death, even in our physical body. We thank you, Father God, that in these days when you establish the kingdom of God, in us, through us, you establish the power of your resurrection in this physical body. Not in the same way like you did in Lazarus where he died again, but in a new and living way where we become the flesh of his flesh, the bone of his bone, where permanently and forever physical body is transformed, changed into the resurrected, glorious body of Jesus Christ. Seal this truth in our heart and our mind. Let this reality come forth because it is in your word. The resurrection power of Jesus is giving life to our physical bodies now. Let our physical bodies receive the fullness of it and be transformed to the glorious body of Jesus. For we are His glorious church. It is our destiny. It is our living legacy to show forth the fullness of the glory of God upon our spirit, upon our soul, and upon our physical body. We can see it in your word and let it be a reality in each one of our lives. We give thanks and praise and worship to you for all this Beautiful and wonderful promises. We don't care what all the traditional teaching tells us, but we care only for the word and the promises of God. And we are not uh, defeated or nor are we going to think by like what all the other Christians and denominations think. We're going to think like Paul did. He said, he pressed forward to attain. And that word attain means to receive in fullness. To come to the place of the fullness of the resurrection body of Christ. We believe it. We believe it. And we know we don't have to wait until the last trump is sounded. And... In an instant, we are transformed and are received into heaven. We believe that now on the earth, in our lifetime, in our destinies that are not completed yet, we can become the glorious body of Christ. 
and our physical bodies can be changed and transformed into a resurrected body. We believe in your word and we receive. Thank you, Father, for your resurrection power. Not just in our spirit, not just in our soul, but in our physical bodies. Now, in Jesus' name, we bless you, we thank you. And may we establish 24-hour praise and worship on all corners of the planet of the earth. And lead your people into the legacy of the glorious body of Jesus. Thank you that the powers of the age to come can be demonstrated on this old world. And we praise you and thank you. That is all because of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all because of the promises of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church was born in power. The church shall live in power. The church will leave this planet Earth in power. Thank you, Father. Your word will be fulfilled. In Jesus' mighty name, we proclaim it to all the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.